Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me, I have Professor Anthony Kila, Professor of Strategy and Development, and Institute Director at the Commonwealth Institute of Advanced and Professional Studies, and Chike Ugea, former Commissioner for Information, Data State, and Managing Director at Mark Foley Hospitality Limited. Maybe we should change that so that people will know the name of the hotel. What's the name of the hotel again? <laughs> no, Let's hear from you. No, no, leave the hotel. <laughs> the, 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 anyway. the holding company is fine. Anyway, gentlemen, mm. good to have you again on the uh, program. We have discussed a number of subjects today. The Queen Niger, the Russia-Africa Summit, the ministerial list submitted to the Senate by President Tinubu and the screening will start uh, tomorrow. And then sports development, sports management, the ongoing Women's uh, uh, World Cup. These are the topics we have looked at with our guest, Professor Jidofo Adibe, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the Nasarawa State University, and Professor Sadiq Abdullahi, uh, who teaches uh, sports curriculum, sports management, sports development uh, in the United States at the Miami International University in Florida. Let me start with you, uh, Chiki Ogea. I listened to uh, Professor Kila during the week, his views about cabinet list and all that. So uh, I'll come to him today to talk about international relations. <laughs> but let me start with you, sports and the ministerialist. Or the Queen EJ. Well, 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 well let's, let's start from this problem in Niger because that seems to be the most topical thing as we speak. Um, the president of Nigeria is actually the, there's a name for it, president in council or what, of the oh, ECOWAS um, group as it is now. And they called an extraordinary meeting in Abuja. We just ended not too long ago. The chairman. Oh, exactly. And um, basically, uh, we had thought that we had moved away from the eras of um, military coups. When I was in the university, um, I was taught in a, in a course I did in law that um, military coups, once they are successful and they overtake a pre-existing legal order becomes lawful and becomes a, a, an administration like we used to have in Nigeria in the 70s, in the 80s, when we had all from Gawan to Babangida all the way to Abacha. Uh, but, you know, this is the 20s um, and it's a new time in the continent, in the subcontinent and um, we seem to have moved away from that. And that is why there's a maxim right now being band, bandied around saying that the worst form of democracy is even better than the best form of military rule you could get. So as we speak now, military rule is supposed to be an aberration. And when we take it from that point, we will understand why the whole of the sub-region is reacting the way they are reacting. Because if it can happen in Niger next door to us, aside from, of course, like we said, security and economic implications that can, you know, happen in Nigeria, um, then that means before we know it, military coup will become, you know, the vogue again. So, but now the big question is, what can they really do? Uh, ECOWAS, I remember there was a time they used to have the ECOMOG fighting force and all of that. Are they going to move into Niger now? to remove that uh, military adventurer and reinstall the former president? Or are they just going to sit down and Georgia and make all these, you know, declarations? How is it going to be enforced? You know, so these are the new, new challenges that are being put forward now in, you know, in the sub-region and in Africa generally, because I believe that it's really in Africa right now that we still have these issues of military adventurers popping up here and again. I mean, there was Guinea, there was Mali, and then all these flashpoints we also have around the different areas in, in, in um, DRC and all of that. So that's the bigger challenge, if you ask me. Yes, military coups are no longer in vogue. Um, they should stay to their constitutional responsibilities of securing the territorial integrity of countries and all of that. 
not they don't have any training in administration in civil rule or and any of that so i think like i said we'll wait to see what ECOWAS will do um kudos to the president for taking the initiative and then we'll just see how it pans out you know that's for the niger situation yeah when we come to the minister the ministerial list uh, like a lot of people said, you know, I like to look at these things from the legal point of view. There is even this, um, this um, question that what has just happened with the list, is it really legal? Because the constitution says there must be one minister per state. Then I think, I don't know if it is the constitution that said that, you should help me here. This talk about six other ministers from the zones and then plus an additional minister from the FCT. That is why usually for a fully composed cabinet, you should have 43 ministers. But what we had was 28 ministers. On, I think it was the day before the, it lapsed, or, is, or was it on the due date? 58 days. 58 days, okay, fine. So it was within time. Now there's a question. 28 ministers, does that satisfy the constitutional requirement of giving us ministers? No, the president says yes. through the chief of staff yes. that 13 more names will yes. be submitted. Fine. Now, the, uh, what the constitution says is that there must be a minister from each state, each state. Fine. to recognize the principle of federal character and in section 14. So there has, not been, the constitution. there has not been a minister from each state as we speak now. Although, the five states although, have been covered. Yes, although Professor Adibe said something which I held on to. He said, what does the Constitution say if you do not do that, like we have now? I think there's a vacuum there. No, the Constitution it, is silent on that. Yes, however, yes, yes. however, the governors. It's yes. not just the uh, president that is covered by that alteration. Yes. Or Section 147, Subsection 2. Many governors are not even sure yet. We agree, but we know it's the president we're talking about. That's a big, um, that's a big, um, big picture as we speak now. Um, but be that as it may, I mean, I believe there are a lot of legal gurus around the president, even his chief of staff, you know. Um, um, I've seen from the name, the person most likely he will use as an attorney general is an SAN. So he, even if you look at his legal team in the, in the tribunal, you can see a plethora of legal luminaries. So I guess whatever this president does now, he will have had sound legal advice. And everything, as you know, as I know, being lawyers, it's all going to be conjecture, and it's going to be something they can go to a court of law to look at. But let us now look at the real merits of what has been done. Um, like Professor Adibe said, what kind of people are we waiting for? Um, whether it's been four months or six months like... Um, President Buhari did, or two months like this president has done. What Nigerians don't understand is that you can't invent people. You understand? I don't know whether they expect us to bring people <laughs> from Mars to come and because we are talking about ministers. Because I heard my dear prof during the week, he said an elephant has given birth to a rat. That was his own interpretation of the list. But they are Nigerians. And like we said, there are three broad categories you can use to get your ministers any way you look at it. There's the issue of competence, which is very important. There's the issue of those that have worked for you, right? And then there's the third issue of loyalty, right? So those, those are it. Well, where, um, and people, if you look at that list, broadly, people fit into one of these categories in every way. But specifically now, this government, especially with this um, crisis of legitimacy that it's battling with all over the, you know, with the tribunal still on and all that until that final judgment is given, should, in my mind, be seen as a government of reconciliation and national unity. So whatever it does, it should be all inclusive to carry people along. And I think there are certain people who have played a role in the kind of divisiveness that is going on in Nigeria now, that is almost becoming a cancer, that no matter what they have done, they should be avoided for now. And um, when you now bring um, someone like Nasiru Erufai, like we said, 
who's made so many incendiary um, um, comments about Christians and all these things. Even there was that video he was speaking in Hausa. I didn't even understand what he was saying, but there were all kinds of interpretation about it and all of that. You know, people like that. And, so, and then he himself has even said he was a minister at 43, which is true. What is he going to come back and do at 63, 20 years later? But his name is there. So, but you see, I know how this thing works because you've been there, I've been there. The, the president might think, yes, because whether we like it or not, I know he was a great voice in, at a very critical time of when that, especially due to the Muslim-Muslim ticket, when that election could have gone. He was the one that rallied the northern governors that supported him, and that cannot be wished away. So it's all about him. But, but if it's about being deserving, oh, yes, he's deserving of that, and whatever it is he wants. But I thought that, you know, based on what he said, uh, my other guy from the South South, the governor of River State, though he's even in the PDP. Former. He, the former governor of River State, exactly, thank you. Though he's even in the PDP, he told us that he cannot leave a place where he's suffering from malaria and go to where he is, there is cancer. Stage four uh, cancer. Yeah, exactly. And he also said to us that there's only one minister from a state at any point in time. Why must it be him? Again, maybe because of the yeoman effort he put into the, for the president in, in River State. That is why the president has seen it fit to call him. Well, I assume that maybe by tomorrow there will be a further communication that those two gentlemen have recused, recused themselves on the basis of what they have hey, said before. No, no, I'm telling hey, you, because mind. it is not tenable. They are th those two candidatures, they are not tenable. That is true, based on what they have what said. What about David Umai? You know, well, exactly. That, Who has that, 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 that is even something I don't understand, because I don't see how you can leave a tenured uh, position as a senator or a distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to go into a cabinet that you can be removed? Does he not understand that that cabinet can be, he, he or the cabinet can be sacked the next day after the, after the inauguration? He has no, no certain tenure. So that, again, I don't understand how it works. But, you know, these people, they've been everything, so they know what it is they're looking for, you know. Um, but be that as it may, we saw some, some competence in the area of competence, you know, uh, the Musawa lady, uh, Pate, um, Wale, do you know, a few technocrats, a few people that know their onions, they are there. Then, like I said, we've seen those. You see, whether you like it or not, our people must understand this. Tinubu is a politician to the core. He is intelligent, yes, he's an accountant and all that, but basically his life has been all around about politics. And one thing I can tell you about politics, having been involved myself, is that politics is 99.9% .9 about loyalty. So mm. Tinubu would always recognize loyalty in everything he does. Loyalty will be a prime purpose. And that is why if you notice, I don't know whether you see the setup the way it is now. I don't know how it is in your time. But even in the meeting we saw, did you see who was sitting next to Tinubu? Mm. You saw who was sitting next to him. That is loyalty speaking. Uh, Maybe he doesn't have a, a, a minister of foreign affairs yet, but that was loyalty speaking. Uh, except Chike Oga. Loyalty should not uh, present itself as psychopathy well, that, or hypocrisy. Well, that, Two major elements uh, that uh, I agree with you. the governance process. I agree with you, but when a man has been through the meal all these years, fighting in the field as it were, and those people have remained consistent, they have not blinked, when people like that and eventually things come through, you have to have those people with and you. With Professor Kia, that is what is going on. What do you on. think on this uh, plethora of subjects that we have considered today? Well, on this subject, because, you know, just to help people's attention, given that um, Chico Gale was talking about the ministerial list, I think it's important for our viewers to be able to distinguish between the sociology and philosophy of issue, i.e. the description of reality and understanding of what things ought to be. I think it's, um, it's important, you know, we talk about loyalty, of course there's loyalty in everything, there's loyalty with your gate man, with your lover, with your rice seller, but the point is that if you're going to be a statesman and manage affairs of the state, there should be some elements of standards and 
vision and something that uplifts people, not survival of self. I mean, that's, it gets to be a bit pedestrian when we limit everything that way. If we want our young people to aspire to something bigger, I do not think we should fill them up with this idea of layout and, and everything. We should talk about statesmanship or on vision. I have no qualms with any of the members, including the senator that wasted people's time only to be nominated for um, a ministerial post. I have no, um, no problem with Verify. I have no problem with the visionary leader, Wiki. I have no problem with anybody in the least. That, that's the prerogative of the president. My issue, you know, is, is wasted opportunity. Because we're coming from a president who wasted so much time of our life without a cabinet, I was hoping the new one, which we thought is way better than that one, will come in with something quicker, more radical, something fresher. When we say we don't have to invent people from outside the world, the people who have the right to be there, but in a country of 20 million people, when the same people keep appearing every time, you know, it gives you a bit of sense of stale, and, and, and I don't like staleness, you know. It, Africa is a young continent. Nigeria is a country that has many steps to be taken. I think we should be thinking of innovation and freshness. I argue, and this is a bad thing, you know, we're sort of in a regression. The cabinet that Tinubu, the governor of Lagos State, did the first and second time, I think it's fresher than this one is being as president. I argue that the cabinet that Obasanjo gave was fresher and presented more quality than this one, albeit less political and less experienced. But that is an opinion. You know, people are, are free to go the way they go. Let's just hope for the best. There's also something interesting. If they follow Chike Ogier's position and some of these ministers then decide not, or these nominees, you know, I've started using the language, they're not ministers, they're, they're nominees. If these nominees then decide not to take up their position, then we shall be having a new theory in Nigeria, which is that of placeholders in ministerial appointment. That means to meet the deadline of 60 days, some names were put forward, then later they are changed. I think all these things, at some point, we're going to measure what it does to the psychic of people. As a citizen, because I want Nigeria to be well, I wish them all, and I wish well um, the government and everybody, because I also because I know some of these people personally. Well, I thought I was going to ask you to yes. comment on the Russia-Africa summit. Yes. You teach... Uh, International... You're very glad. To, yes. The, well, from the J to Russia, Africa is still trying to find its voice and its place. You know, this idea that one country calls the whole of Africa is something that does not sit well in terms of dignity and ego. But then we need it because Russia is promising debt relief and is promising free grain. So who are you not to go to somebody who's promising that? And it brings a kind of nostalgic feeling you know, for the bipolar world. Because right now, Russia is promising that the Western bloc has to do a counter-offer, a, a counter and in the middle of it, you know, Africa has a way to benefit. I wish we were being, um, what's the word, um, courted. I wish we were being wooed because of the skills of our young people, because of our intellectual powers, and not through free debts, granting, and grain. But you know, th th that's the trend now. What we need to do, in, in the middle of all this, Russia offering one thing, um, the West are likely to counter um, something better. There's also a risk in the middle of it that in international relations, you have two options of dealing with a country. It's either you bring an open offer, like the way Russia is doing, or you get them weak leadership so that you can influence their policy without offering the state something. You know, that's the kind of Machiavellian thing that African need needs to be aware of. And, and that takes us to the issue of the Niger situation. That's where we're having this in Niger now. Um, a fear of epidemic of coup around Africa. Yes, it is there. Three things make coup imp impossible. The, the three factors are one, legitimacy of governance, two, good governance, and three, inoperability of a government in power. So, okay. uh, gentlemen, both of you have not said anything about sports development. Yes. Sports management. If we can do that briefly before we take just one more topic, okay. and we'll wrap it up today. Okay. Chiki Ogia. Okay, sports. Uh, sports. My life as a young man was all about sports. And um, I totally, you know, identify with what happened over the weekend, uh, which is mainly the topic for now. What the gentleman that... Um, the chairman of APIS and um, the NIIA did over the years. I mean, for those uh, sporting heroes who, through no fault of theirs, 
could not be called Olympians because mm -hmm. there was a political issue and the country had to boycott the Olympics in 1976. And typical of Nigeria, these guys just go to waste. Just like you, 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 you brought up the quick um, situation of Jerry Okorududu, who was he, he, he was even an Olympian. He was an Olympian. Uh, 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 and, and see the way he died. There was, like you said, nobody to even bring 600,000 to claim his body. So we haven't been good to our sportsmen in the country. We have, I remember a situation of one of these Eagles that won one of uh, one continental championship. They got, and they were promised houses. Maybe that was the Aikomu government or something. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get these houses in the games village in Abuja till maybe 20 years later, you know, mm -hmm. and all that. So even our girls right now, there's an issue with their, bonuses. With their bonuses and all of that. So we haven't been fair as a country, but you see, it is a reflection of everything else. We can't do well in sports management and all of that when everything else, you it know. Is going <laughs> back, yeah. So it's just a pity. I think the situation is sad, you know, if, you know, people are not getting rewarded for shining for that country or participating for that country. But that's where we are, and as they rightly noticed, is the state of things in the country. I propose moving forward that we should commercialize our sports. You know, privatize it so that the, the people doing sport will be living not of grants from government but from sponsorship as is done everywhere in the world and then there will be things like insurance life insurance pension and all those kind of things that can really value their effort because really Nigerians if everybody really wants to wait for government without looting it's a bit of a problem in life I think we need to create situations strategic situations that can do without government and since sports people more than doctors affect millions at a time, I think they can pay for themselves if well managed. We just need strategic management in sports. Okay, let's take one more subject before we call it a day. As at Friday last week, medical services in most government-owned hospitals was rapidly shutting down, following the ongoing strike by resident doctors with no word from the government since the inception of the strike. Our eyes correspondent, Chinaza Samuel, reports. of the strike by the resident doctors across the country and citizens in need of medical services are beginning to feel the brunt. A visit around some hospitals within Abuja city centre shows that health services in government-owned hospitals are somewhat slow. We stopped at the Federal Medical Centre in Jabi district of Abuja, where the situation is the same. Patients now have to spend longer time to get to see a healthcare provider. For some residents whose loved ones are in admission at the hospital, the quality of service has reduced. There are simply not enough doctors on ground to provide adequate care for everyone. So I've been here, I've come here a couple of times and I keep expecting for the services to be a little bit higher than it is now, but it hasn't changed, which is sad. For Caroline, the situation is no different. It took over nine hours to get to see a healthcare provider, as opposed to the two hours or less before the strike action. I've been here since 7 and I'm supposed to have left here maybe by 10 but you can see the time now is past for and I'm still here. It took me a whole day and it's not funny at all. The doctors commenced the strike in the early hours of Wednesday following the failure of the Nigerian government to meet their demands. They are, among other issues, demanding the immediate payment of the 2023 medical residency training funds as well as payment of all salary arrears owed its members since 2015. Chinaza Samuel, Arise News. Resident doctors have been on this for months. The government has now said it's offering them 25% increase in hazard allowance. They say that's too small, too little, unacceptable. But the major challenge that we face in Nigeria is that organized labor, the Nigerian Labor Congress and also the TUC, Trade Union Congress, have also served notice that they will shut down Nigeria from August 2. August 2, I guess, is by Tuesday. Wednesday. Tuesday. Yes. Okay, so you have resident doctors already on strike, 
saying the strike will continue. You have organized labor saying they will go on strike. In their own case, because of first subsidy uh, increase, I don't know, first subsidy remover, and the increase in the hardship of the people. Resident doctors, because of unpaid comments, what they call comments, unpaid hazard allowance, unpaid arrears, and all of that. Now, is it too early in the day for the Chinumbu administration to begin to grapple with the reality, with the threat of a shutdown of the system? What do you think? Let me start with you this time, uh, Professor Kila. Well, I think the sad situation, you know, you, you, one will hope that um, doctors will not strike. You know, one will say to doctors, please. Well, they are going on strike in England too anyway. No, no. Well, I, by the way, yeah. when I say things, it's a global thing. In your other thing. country. No, no. When I say my positions are always global, I do not have Nigerian positions. Okay. What I say in one country, I'm able to say it anywhere in the world because I work in about five countries. And so my, 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 my view is always that. that, that I think... Anywhere, one would hope doctors will not strike. But then, doctors do not eat needles. You know, they need money as well. And that's the problem we have. In the situation where we have, there's no money in the country. I think doctors need to recognize that. But I do hope, I have faith in this government for one thing. This new administration are very good at managing conflicts. They manage at managing people's perception in the sense that it doesn't erupt. I don't know who else will be ruling Nigeria when the rule will not the, the road will not be full of protesters by now. But because there's a sense, there's a link between the civil society and the government in power, I think the government can manage it. There's a lesson here for organized labor, organized societies, and non-governmental organizations. That is to bring forward their agenda during election. Doctors are talking that they've not been paid for about 10 years, since, I'm sorry, for um, eight years, 2015. They should have brought this thing forward during the election so that they get a promise from the incoming administration, a, a, a specific and detailed promise. I think we need to start thinking beyond now in all realms of our society. Thank you, girl. Well, um, if you look at the situation now, let's, let's go back a little bit. How palatable is it that um, this situation was allowed to... Fester on. Yes, till now. Um, Tinubu was sworn in... I mean, Tinubu won the election in March or thereabout and had these two months before now to, to think through how he was going to put, you know, the policies together. Because I think all this is happening because... You know, he hit the ground running, and of course, right from the <laughs> minute zero, he had said, first subsidy is gone. Now, this is, the, this is the effect that we are grappling with, because nothing has been put in place to cushion, you know, the effect for the people as it were. And like um, Prof said, yeah, you could be good managers, good conflict managers, and all of that, but, but that's not the situation. That's not what we you know we really need now what we need now is a solution to the hardships being faced by nigerians um, it is really difficult for the average nigerian today i don't want to even start talking about poor and all that they keep talking about poor nigerian there's everybody's poor in nigeria if we haven't understood that, that by now then we are we are fooling ourselves you know you the whole are, country is poor no no no, no, no forget all poor. that everybody you don't is look poor, poor. Okay. you guys are looking so, so, you are so, glowing so, no, so that's only in your time <laughs> <laughs> so the truth the, time is the, quite silky to me the truth is that we really need to get this measures of what we are doing like I have always said it's not about this um, social investment things they keep talking about I'm not a fan of all those things I'm a fan of improving our critical sectors putting money in health so that this kind of thing should stop Saudi Arabia used to come here for health services in the 70s, UCH was world class. Let's revamp our health institutions. And the only way we can do that is taking from that 70 billion that they want to take to the National Assembly, spread it around, put money in health, put money in other things, in transportation, go CNG. These are the things we need to do because we all agree that, yes, it's time for this, um, this, this theft, as I, as I, you know, this crime being committed with the foil subsidy because that's just blatant thievery, if you ask me. So let's, let's do all that, but more importantly, let us start, you know, whatever help Dangote needs to 
get because that refinery is the be one of the biggest if not the biggest in the world so that refinery will come in as a game changer as well now i'm hearing talk about that refinery it might not come on stream till 2025 by then, this country might have gone under because that refinery was one of the critical things we were all hoping on that would come in as a stopgap and start sorting out this whole fuel situation. Okay, before we go, I, I've seen stories, you know, uh, organized labor advising people to stock food items, water, because the country is likely to be shut down in the next few days. Have you people, uh, you know, made arrangements with... Uh, your house assistants and I'm particularly fine. madame to stock up uh, food items. The, the truth is that we've, <laughs> we've always known strikes in Nigeria and there's nothing that, is, there's no sacrifice that is too much for uh, people when it comes to when a country has to make a statement about things that con concern the generality of well, the people. I, I, I hope the government It's not will about step me in. or you. How the government will step in yeah. to stop the strike. That's yeah. one thing you we can You think it can be averted? I think it can be averted. You know, it's just a good robust okay, conversation. Maybe if, if the government comes forward. If the government comes we're forward. We're declaring 200,000 naira as minimum wage. Well, no, maybe not that much. The, the, the country hasn't got the money and as an economist, I, I don't even believe in that. That's going to cause inflation. I think the government needs to go to the table and have a conversation, a strategic that conversation that will look into fiscal issues that is and it. credit management. There's a lot of things that can be done without spending money immediately if the government can guarantee transaction. Because, you see, let me come in Can they quickly. do that in the Prof. next three, three days? They yes, have, it can they be have done. to. They, they have to. Because it can if be you done. Listen they just to, need to sit in a room if you and listen talk to, to people. If you listen to labor, that is their greatest grouse. Yes. That these guys are not serious with them. Yes. They don't send anybody. Mm -hmm. They send one or two people. Yeah. Wow. I think wow. the president can even shock them and appear himself. So I think it's and all say, about let's talk. It's, it's about that and let's will. Talk, please. I think the will. We, I think the, the, the ruling the, the class ball. needs to understand that a, a, a total strike, a general strike, now is a disaster, and let us avoid it. No, I'm sure the government knows that. Okay. The government on, knows on that, that note, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Chike Ogea, thank and you. also Professor Anthony Kila for joining us on This Day Live. As Good always, time. the Sunday talk show. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching.